In the past, we've kind of started it off with just uh, in investments and looking at how did it go last quarter? Let's let's start there. Yeah, let's start with history first. We'll get into some of the numbers and how markets performed in this last quarter, in the second quarter of 2024. Um, looking at stocks first, uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average, that's a common one that folks follow. follow. That's actually down in the quarter, down about 1.2%. S&P 500, the largest 500 companies in America, that was up, is up about 43 And the uh, NASDAQ, which of course, more technology-oriented companies, that was up a lot, that was about 8.5%, which was led quite a bit by tech stocks. We'll get into a little bit more of that. Uh, rounding out, getting outside the U.S., international markets, emerging markets is up a little over 5% for the quarter. And uh, the, the developed market was about even. You want to get into bonds at all? Yeah, Turning. speaking of even, bonds are basically even on the quarter as well. And mm -hmm. first quarter, bonds didn't do a whole lot either. So if we look in total for bonds on the year, haven't done a whole lot, been pretty even. Let's talk about uh, the concentration in some of these indexes. Uh, you mentioned a couple of them, um, S&P 500, um, NASDAQ, those both performed very well this last year and certainly in the quarter. Yeah, yeah, so concentration, thinking about S&P 500, for example, the largest 500 companies in America, and that index is weighted, I mean it's compiled or put together based on how big each company is. So the biggest company is gonna get the biggest weight and so on as it, as it goes down to the 500th company. The top 10 companies right now in the S&P 500 make up about 35% of the index, okay? Now that's considered to be pretty concentrated. Uh, that's a big number for the top 10 holdings. That means the other 490 are making up about 65%. And in a quarter, in that first half, like we've had, those same companies have actually been the ones pulling most of the weight mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in terms of performance. Yeah, maybe just to note that, uh, you know, while you can't invest directly in an index, right, that's not a, not a thing per se, but many, um, many funds model themselves after these indexes and uh, rebalance their they're kind of weight. Right. Indexing has become a very popular uh, method for investing, just buying the entire market. You can buy an S&P 500 index fund, for example, very low cost. Um, it can be tax efficient as well and just buy the market. Um, mm -hmm. That's been very popular. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Getting back to the concentration, if we look at NASDAQ, it's even more concentrated. Of course, NASDAQ, is, again, is more tech-oriented businesses. That one's about 50% of that NASDAQ index is really the top 10 companies. Mm -hmm. So we've had really good performance out of the stock market this year, mm -hmm. S&P 500 being our example. Um, but in, in the last quarter, so there's 11 different sectors that make up the US stock market, right? You have technology, energy, utilities, right? There's 11 total sectors. And just four of them are positive last quarter, right? So that means eight of them had a negative return and four were positive. Those four made the generated, you know, that pulled the entire weight mm -hmm. of the market, made the whole market positive. So the reason we bring that up is that concentration is not necessarily a bad thing. It's an observation we make, and we understand that, and we believe that it won't always remain concentrated. There's going to be some turnover and some churning that's going to happen there. It doesn't mean it's going to imminently decline, that we're going to go through a period of negative markets, but it's a sign that the market is not as healthy as what it would be if there was more participating in the overall advance. Mm -hmm and we've been in a cycle where the U.S. market has been in favor. If we look overseas though, there's still a lot of opportunities overseas. And in fact, on the year, if we look at a couple of different regions, um, so now we're looking at the whole year, not just the quarter, S&P, the U.S. market through the first two quarters is up 15%. That's a great performance in just half a year. But you look elsewhere, you look at, well, Japan, uh, Japan was up about 21%, China, or Taiwan rather is up 37%, India is up 17%. There's a lot of businesses that are performing quite well in other parts of the world. And those are good reasons to be diversified across other regions because they won't always move in tandem with what the US is doing. Mm. You may see performance um, zig and zag, which again is the importance of the reason we want to diversify to other types of economies. Mm -hmm. And I think there is, there's maybe an asterisk or a caveat to some of those uh, global equity market numbers, right? So those, you know, Japan uh, re performing at 21%, uh, right? So what's, what is that caveat? Yeah, so when we invest overseas, we, as U.S.-based investors, at the end of the day, we convert our investment changes back to U.S. dollars. 
and this all happens automatically. It's not something that we have to calculate. It just happens automatically with the investments held in the different accounts. But as an example is um, if we buy into Japanese companies, um, we're exposed to both the companies moving up and down in price as well as the currency. So mm -hmm. the U.S. dollar compared to the yen, right. how is that exchange rate moving? Now, in this last, in this first part of the year, the companies have been performing well. Um, they've been, like I said, they're up uh, 21%. The yen currency has not been, it's been depreciating against the dollar or the dollar's been strengthening against mm -hmm. the yen. Mm -hmm. And that's had an offsetting effect or impact to the price performance. Another way to say it is, as the dollar strengthens, it takes away from some of the return, again, because we're US-based investors. So to summarize that, the US dollar rising has been a headwind for certain international markets, Jap Japan being one of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's skip ahead and kind of get more economic here. Mm -hmm. There's a couple on our, our uh, to-do list here. So just thinking about home prices, um, uh, probably for our clients and our, you know, you know, if you're over 60, you maybe already have your home. Uh, you've maybe gotten it at a, a, a decent interest rate compared to current terms. Um, what are we seeing in the home markets? Yeah, one of the interesting things we've seen, this has not happened for quite some time, um, Existing home prices, so both home, new homes and existing home prices generally have moved higher in the last several years. Really going back mm -hmm. to 2019, 2020, we saw a price appreciation in both. The cost of a new home has gotten higher in existing home. But for the first time in quite a while, we've seen the price of existing homes move higher than the price of new homes. Okay. Stated another way is for a long time, people pay a premium to buy a new home on average. Right now it's more expensive to buy a used home. That's unusual. It is, yeah. It's a, maybe even counterintuitive. You'd think a new home would be b more uh, expensive. It's brand new. You're the first to live in it. Mm -hmm. What are the forces at play here? The big force and one of the big changes we've seen the last couple of years is the cost of borrowing. Mm -hmm. Interest rates have moved higher. Mortgage rates have moved higher. There was a time in 20, you know, pre-2022 where you could get into a new, get into a mortgage for a new house, you know, three and a half percent or below for 30 right. years. You could borrow money for 30 years for at three and a half percent. That was extremely low, right? And since then we've seen interest rates move higher. And uh, I just looked recently and one, one source was citing six, 6.7, 6.8% mortgage rates. So, you mm -hmm. know, call it almost double. double. Yeah. Um, and what's effectively happened is that those that are in a home, so we've owned our home since 20, 2009, but we refinanced it in 2018 when rates were really low. Mm -hmm. We're in a low interest rate mortgage at three and a quarter. I don't have a strong incentive to want to make a change because if I have to buy a new home, I'm buying it with current mortgage rates. Mm -hmm. That creates this kind of um, lock-in effect, right? I'm locked into a three and a quarter for the next, well, uh, 20 some six years, years yeah, yeah. Uh, 27 years, whatever it is, um, I'm not that motivated to move. And that's happening across across the country. Mm -hmm. People are effectively locked, have a lock-in effect because you have a low interest rate mortgage. Let's move into another economics uh, topic here. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's speed round time or fast round. Let's and do it. That is uh, inflation and wage growth. Wage growth has been rising in absolute terms. However, in terms of a year-over-year -year basis, has been coming down. Same as inflation, inflation and wage growth. Mm -hmm. um, both have been, you know, the things we buy has been getting more expensive, but it's getting more expensive at a lower rate. Same thing with wages. It's going up, but at a lower rate. So it's a decelerating rate of change, we call that. Yeah, there are fewer jobs. There are still some number of people looking for jobs. There's fewer jobs than there had been. Mm -hmm. um, which makes it harder to negotiate for a higher wage. Uh, you know, and if you're a company, that may mean more for your bottom line, not having yeah. to kind of pay out on that particular labor line item. As I mentioned before, the jobs market's still you know, relatively tight. There's some signs where we're seeing some um, changes, but relatively tight labor market still. Um, all this can lead us to sentiment, and maybe sentiment is a reflection of these things, you know, how the economy is doing, how inflation is. Um, it kind of rounds it out. You know, so what it all adds up to in terms of sentiment, we have seen sentiment deteriorate somewhat lately. 
um, in terms of how people feel about mm-hmm. their financial situation. Oddly enough, or perhaps oddly enough, when sentiment is at its worst, when it's at low points, historically after that is when you see stocks tend to do pretty well. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a contrarian indicator. It's like mm-hmm. when everything feels terrible and the sentiment's low, on a go-for basis, it tends to be a point where financial markets or stock markets tend to do pretty well. Rounding the show out here and some of our takeaways, it seems like that you know at, at Vector we you know we're doing some rebalancing. You mentioned that earlier. Mm-hmm. It is a good time to look at rebalancing opportunities when you have big swings in financial markets, whether it's stocks doing really well or one particular segment of the stock market. Mm-hmm it can present opportunities to do some good, healthy rebalancing, selling some of the things that have done well or outperformed and rebalance into other segments of the market, perhaps that are more either defensive or stable, or even just ones that are perhaps underperforming at this time or mm-hmm. um, underperforming the top performers. Um, so those are all those are things we're working through to look at in terms of um, portfolio actions. And again, those are things that investors really should look at those um, throughout any given year. There's gonna be opportunities mm-hmm. for those things. Right, it seems like this would be a, it depends, or there's, it's another one of these nuanced answers, right? So if you're in an accumulation phase, you would have a different tolerance, uh, a different time horizon for this. If you are, uh, you know, much older, um, you may have a shorter time horizon and, and may need to yeah, really think about all this. Yeah, this spot, allocation. spot on. Yeah. Um, accumulators that are adding to their portfolios, whether it's a 401k or putting money into a brokerage account, right? that's a good rebalancing mechanism by default. You're earning money from your job, mm-hmm. you're putting it to work in your portfolio. That in itself is rebalancing. You're buying periodically. If the markets decline, you're, you have an automatic program going on to be buying. It's not the case when you're in the distribution phase or mm-hmm. in the traditionally retirement phase. right? You've got a finite perhaps amount of resources at that point in time and you have a plan to have that last your lifetime um, and, and perhaps other um, whether legacy planning or whatever it might be. The point being there is that there's less, there's fewer levers. And so right. even more important to make sure that we're looking at rebalancing opportunities, making sure the income needs are set aside and are in a reliable fashion so that there's not a disruption to, uh, to spending. It's not about setting it up for the next 30 years and, and just kind of letting it ride along, it's going to require changes and review over time because life changes. Yeah, and it's always that finding that balance between your, your life goals and your life situation circumstance as well as the market side. And that's, I think, the, the interesting part about this show is that we're kind of looking at the market side and trying to make sense of it so that we can be better prepared and better well balanced perhaps for mm-hmm. that kind of human side for the there's uncontrollables in both yeah exactly and that's the importance of having the plans and the financial plan those different projections we're putting together and those assumptions how we think about looking into the future making sure that we have a connection between that and what's going on in the investments yeah. right? you want to have your investments aligned with your plan and as they change look to change both sides of it because like i said that's that's going to happen I think this is a a great spot to kind of wrap up. Um, Certainly, if people are uh, hearing this for the first time, welcome. Thanks for listening. Uh, We would appreciate, you know, subscribe, uh, share this uh, with your friends. Uh, There's certainly episodes, as we kind of alluded to, that are more on the, uh, you know, uh, financial wellness planning. We do um, some kind of fun little case studies or sort of what-if scenario thinking Um, So, yeah, we're glad to have you along for any future pods. And Jason, thanks for coming on this one and giving us some market perspective. Hey, thanks for listening to our podcast. Information presented is for educational purposes only and does not intend to make an offer or solicitation for the sale or purchase of any specific securities, investments, or investment strategies.